I'm going to talk about two events that, you know, one event we, we love, you know, absolutely love, and it's, you know, it's getting around that, you know, a certain time of the year. The next one a lot of people don't know about, don't want to hear about, and that's the fact because that in the second coming at his revealing, when he sets his foot upon the earth, when he comes back with his saints, people don't want that. You know why? Because that's the judgment upon those that have not, uh, that are not believers in Christ. Mark chapter uh, 13 Verses uh, 24 through 27, the Bible reads, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon uh, shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken. And then uh, shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then uh, shall, shall he send his angels and shall uh, gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Lord. Lord, I ask that this morning that you would fill me with your spirit, Lord, that I would uh, completely co uh, convey your truth, Lord, uh, that I would speak your truth not only um, the, the reality of it, but also in love, Lord, and that you would give us ears to hear what you would have for us, Lord, and that our hearts would be ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. We obviously are nearing, I mean, obviously, we, uh, you know, this Thursday we have Thanksgiving coming up, right? So we're nearing the time of year set aside to commemorate the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hear Advent, and we, uh, some, some of us have no idea what that means. The first advent of Advent, literally, that means the first coming of Christ. Okay, so if there's a first coming of Christ, there obviously has to be a second coming of Christ. But the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world, we celebrate Christmas. That's when you know, Jesus Christ came into this world, right? You know, when we remember the birth of God's Son into the world, that, uh, you know, everybody is pretty familiar with this uh, event. The world, the, the world itself is familiar with Bethlehem, the, the shepherds, Mary and Joseph, the wise men, the angel, the frankincense, uh, the frankincense, myrrh and gold along with the other parts of the Christmas story. But the world is less familiar with the Lord's second coming. Before Jesus went to the cross to die for, uh, for our sins, he, uh, he wanted his disciples to understand what would happen when, uh, when he returned the second time. So in a very clear, concise language, the Lord, uh, the Lord tells his disciples and us what will happen when he returns. When I say when he returns, again, I am speaking about the revealing of Christ when he comes in the clouds with his saints, set his, uh, his foot upon the earth, upon Mount Sinai, and splits it, and everybody will know and see him. I'm not talking about the rapture. That's what I talked about last week. How many of you are excited you know, in knowing that the rapture is coming soon? And when I say coming soon, some of you, you know, automatically people will say, well, when? You know, put a date on it. You know what? Could be, you know, could be tomorrow, could be today, could be next year, could be the next 25 years. But if, if you know, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, if it's within 25 years, isn't that near? I know that we sit upon this earth and we go, you know what, 25 years. But then I go, man, it was 25 plus years ago that I got saved. And I was like, it just seemed like it was yesterday. It's like time flies, right? Sometimes when you're having fun, sometimes when you're not. It flies no matter what. But the thing is, is that, you know, like I said, I want to share with you what the Lord shared with them on that day. I mean, let me, say, you know, let me just say this, that we need to live in the light of His coming. We need to live according, you know, you know, in light of his coming, according to Titus chapter 2, verse 13, where it, says, it talks about the blessed hope of the believer, the rapture of the church, right? It is the hope for the believer, and it is the damnation for the unbeliever. So it is important that we have some understanding of the events that will surround his return. People don't like hearing that word you know, that I just said, the damnation of unbelievers, because there's pe uh, people out there, there's people you may be here this morning or even listening online with the fact that they were always told that no matter what, if they were a good person, that they were going to heaven. That has no way, uh, that there's no way in the Bible that it even talks about it. The thing is, is that they say, well, Christians are condemning, they're, they're always talking about that they have to believe a certain way. Is that not true of every religion? 
every religion out there has some sort of standards of how you get into heaven. But the thing is, is that Christianity is different in this fact. All other religions will tell you that you must continue to do something. You must continue to do good works. And hopefully your bad works are less than your good works, and then you get into heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't say that, that you have to do good works in order to get to heaven. The Bible says, for by grace, through faith, are you saved. So in other words, that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe in that sacrifice, you believe in that blood atonement that he put up on the cross is enough to save you, and you go to heaven. That's the only thing you have to do. If you ever did anything else, that is the only thing that you ever have to do in order to be saved. But yet people will say, well, that's too difficult. Really? I mean, some people will sit there and, and say, well, I would rather give up all these things in my life. All these difficult things. I mean, I remember when I, you know, when I grew up going to the Catholic Church. I did. I grew up in the Catholic Church. What did I do when Lent came around? And some of you were like, what's Lent? It's like, you know, it's supposed to commemorate the 40, uh, 40 days of fasting that Jesus did, all right? And you're supposed to fast something. You're supposed to get rid of something for 40 days. When I was a kid, I thought I was pretty smart. And, you know, the reason why is because I always gave up something that I didn't like. I gave up, like, lima beans. I never had lima beans, but I was just like, I, I never had them, but I don't really don't want to try them, so I'm going to give those up. I was always faithful. I mean, I, no matter what, I, whatever I gave up, man, I was good at because I didn't like what I gave up in the first place. Obviously, you know, that's not supposed to be, you know, uh, the idea that, you know, it, you know, that we're supposed to do that, but we're also not supposed to be, like the Catholic Church, you know, telling us what, uh, when to fast and when not to fast. We're not supposed to, we're supposed to do that, and the Bible says you, you keep it to yourself. You don't go around going, oh, man, yeah, you know, it's Lent, and I'm fasting right now, and it's pretty difficult because I gave up, you know, uh, you know, those chicken livers that I absolutely hate. I have no idea how chicken livers even taste, but I'm just saying, just throwing something out there. We're supposed to go ahead about our normal business, fasting and, and asking the Lord's direction without anybody knowing. But that's, a, uh, that's beside the point. That's a little rabbit trail, you know, this morning is the fact of that. But when Jesus went away with the promise that he would come again, and we, we talked about it last week in John chapter 14, verse 3, where Jesus said he would come again. And then in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, where Jesus, you know, it says, in like, you know, in like manner, as you, have seen, you know, as you have seen him go away, he will come back the same way, right? And so we know that he's coming again, and that is the rapture of the church, you know, that when he comes again for the church, right, that he is going to do what? He's going to take us out of here, and then after the seven years, we're going to come back with him at the, uh, the revealing, uh, uh, revealing, and he's going to... Um, uh, destroy you know the enemy all the uh, judgment upon all those that come we need to be ready for that coming right we need to be about the father's business we don't need to look busy we need to be busy about the father's business you know that when we um that that when that when this takes place that we're not taken by surprise by it but we're actually joyful in it that when the Lord comes back for his church, when he comes out, you know, about, you know, when the rapture happens, that we're actually, you know, happy about it and said, you know what, I, instead of saying I should have done more. But so, like I said this morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments about the second coming of Christ. And I don't honestly know if I'll get through everything this morning. I'm just telling you that this morning uh, because uh, I have a lot to share and, and hopefully I'm able to get through it. But I don't want to, like, just push and plow through it and you have no idea you know, everything about us. So I want to be able to do it, and I want to do it, you know, I'll be able to do it well. So, like I said, this morning I want to talk to you about the sequence of his coming. I want to talk to you about the setting uh, for his coming and the sign of his coming. So the number one is this, is the sequence of his coming. We see this in verse 24, the beginning part of it says, but in those days after that tribulation. We are told very clearly in these verses when we can expect the return of the Lord. As I said, we are talking about after the great tribulation, because why it says this, he will come after the tribulation of those days. So he even tells us, after the great tribulation, I'm coming with judgment. I'm coming with the saints. I'm coming to get you know, those, the, those that even get saved during that seven-year uh, tribulation. There are going to be people that get saved. There are going to be uh, the Jewish people that get saved. And you say, well, I don't understand how the Jewish people get saved. I don't either, but God's word says it, and so it's going to happen, all right? Because you say, well, how, how would 
how would you know, a people that absolutely hate the Lord right now, that hate the name of Jesus Christ, get saved? A lot of it's going to happen when we are raptured. Because then they're going to realize what Daniel the prophet you know, uh, you know, said that, you know, uh, back, you know, back then about the rapture. They're going to realize and go, I missed the Messiah. I missed, you know, I missed the one. So that's where a lot of that's going to come from. But the days, you know, obviously, he is referring to are identified in verses 14 through 23. I'm not going to read those you know, this morning, but in verses 14 through 23, Jesus will return after the days of the Great, great Tribulation. He will return to this earth, and he will establish his kingdom after those days. The days the Lord has just described for us will be no ordinary period of time. They will be days of affliction. That is talked about in uh, verse 19. Verse 19 says this. It says, For in those days shall be affliction, such as were not from the beginning of the creation, creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. It's going to be a horrible time like the world has never seen before. I have met people. I have talked to people. I've heard people say, Well, you know what? I just want to be there in the tribulation. Why? That's the only question that I have is why? Why would you? It's supposed to be, you know, the worst that, the, you know, human history has ever seen. And people are like, I just want to be there. I'll tell you where I want to be. I want to be up in heaven, like looking down upon it. I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want to be in it. I don't want to be whatever, because you know what that means? That I'm not saved and that I missed the boat. Yes, you know, there's that, you know, yes, you can get saved during that, you know, the, the tribulation. But why would you want to? Why don't you get saved now instead of sitting there going, I think I'll do it in the future? And you don't even know if you're going to make it to that time period. I don't know. I just say, you know what, get right now, okay? But that word affliction, you know, means trouble. Jesus says that there will be, uh, there will be days of tribulation, and that word means trouble, difficulty, or distress. We are living in some trouble sometimes right now, aren't we? And there have been troublesome times in the past. But the days mentioned in, the, uh, in uh, these verses will be times so filled with tur- uh, turmoil and suffering that they are hard to imagine. In fact, we are told that there, uh, that there have never been days like them before, and there will never be days like them afterward. The tribulation described by Jesus will be the worst period of time the world has ever and will ever experience. And for those... in I was going to share this you know, verse later, but I, you know, for those that say, I want to be a part of the tribulation, I want to go through it, I want to see all this stuff, flip over to Amos chapter 5. Amos, you're going, Amos, where is he? Go? Ooh, my, you know. Where is that one? It's, it's after all the major prophets, it's towards the end, you know, like right before the, uh, right before the New Testament. But Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5, verse 18, says this, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. The Bible flat out says that basically, why would you want to be a part of that? It says that it's darkness and not light. That that it says, woe. I mean, in other words, it's like, you know what? You better, you know, you better be listening to what God's word has to say. Because of the fact that you know, it talks about, it says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the, uh, day of the Lord. Saying, I want to see that. And he, t- he tells you, don't. He says, to, uh, to when, it, when is it for you? In other words, if you're saved, it doesn't matter because you're already going to be saved. But he says, you know what? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Why would you want to see that? Why would you want to be a part of that? The days, obviously, I'm going to get back into uh, you know, where I was at, but the days described by, by Jesus will begin at a specific time. Verse 14 of, of Mark chapter 13 talks about the abomination of desolation. This is a reference, uh, reference to the Antichrist, the future demon-possessed world leader, and he will make a, a seven-year treaty with the nation of Israel. That's why you know, there was a lot of talk about the last time when Jared Kushner was, an, uh, was a part of Donald Trump's team, you know, uh, President Trump's team. Why? Because he, he came along and had a peace treaty along with other, uh, not only with Israel, but the other uh, Arab nations for, you know, called the Abraham Accords. And so that's the thing is, is that 
there was a lot of people wondering at that time, is he, you know, well, for one thing, is he the Antichrist? Is he, you know, all these people had that, you know, you know, that kind of perception. And who knows, he still could very well be. Because he, uh, in this administration, he's not necessarily going to be technically a part of Trump's team, but he's still going to be, uh, he's still going to be taking things over, you know, taking care of things over in the Middle East in that area. If he was able to do it once, what makes you think he can't do it again? And that's when they'll rebuild, uh, you know, they're going to rebuild the temple. And as I shared with you last week, one of, you know, uh, Trump's, you know, former, uh, you know, former uh, cabinet members, you know, said, you know what, I don't see why there's not, a, you know, why is there even a problem? You know, a temple can be built on the Temple Mount. And so there's all these things talked about, and that's why Christians are, like, freaking out. That's the reason why you have a red, you know, for, like, uh, six months ago or whatever, six, eight months ago, people were like, the red heifer. The red heifer. You know what the red heifer, you know, is used for? It's supposed to be, like, the first sacrifice, upon, you, know, you know, for that temple. And they say they have a bunch of red heifers over there. Well, you know, sorry, the first sacrifice for um, the temple. That's how they consecrate it. And so when they do that, and once, you know, and once, you know, once they rebuild the temple and they'll begin, you know, worshiping God by the, keeping the sacrifices mandated by the law of Moses, halfway through that period, that seven-year period, the Antichrist will break his treaty with Israel and he will enter into the Holy of Holies in that temple and he will declare that he is God. So basically this morning, obviously, if you haven't, you know, figured it out yet, I'm going to be talking to you about the seven-year period and what happens at the end of the seven-year period, all right? And that once he declares that he is God, he will demand to be worshipped. Thus, he will abominate or desecrate the temple. This event will mark the beginning of the Great Tribulation, that period of time that will last three and a half years, and it will, uh, it will, uh, it will be a time of warfare on an unprecedented scale. It will be a time marked by earthquakes, Famines, disease, false religions, and false Christs. It will be a time so severe that Jesus says, except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. What is he speaking of? It's not talking about salvation or anything else. It's talking about what? Your flesh. It's talking about your physical body. That if the Lord did not shorten those days to three and a half years, you probably wouldn't make it out physically because it's going to be so terrible during that time. And last week I misspoke. I said a third of the Jews. It's actually... Two-thirds of the Jews that will be killed during this time, along with the world's population. During that time, the Antichrist will kill, will try to kill all the Jews. Uh, sadly, two-thirds of the Jews uh, living during that terrible time will die. If you look at Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8, it talks about uh, uh, how two-thirds of, of them will die. He will also try to kill all those who name the name of Christ. That is why the people, uh, the, the people are warned to flee immediately when they see the Antichrist enter the temple. The slaughter in those days will be on a scale that none of us can, uh, can imagine at all. Sorry, and, uh, and, and that part is talked about in Zechariah 13, uh, verses 14 through 18. So like I said, two-thirds of the, of the Jews will be taken away, and according to Bible prophecy... And I need to look at my notes because, uh, again, I misspoke. Over one half of the world's population will die during the days of the tribulation. I mean, just think about that for a moment. So you have two-thirds of the Jews, you know, they're going to be taken out. Half of the world's population are, is going to be taken out. I mean, just uh, think about that. I mean, let that, you know, just sink in for a moment, given the fact that the world's population today is over 8 billion people. So you have half of the world's population gone, two-thirds of the Jews gone, and so it's going to be down to like 4 billion people at that time. They're going, to be, uh, they're going to be killed. Those are the days that are described by Jesus Christ. When those days are ended, he is coming. He's coming again. Let's talk about, you know, we talked about the sequence of his coming. Now we're going to talk about the setting of his coming. Look at verses 24, the latter part of verse 24 and verse 25. It says this, it says, The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. I mean, it is amazing to see how the Lord is setting the stage for his second coming, that earthly rulers announce their coming with like parades and pomp and ceremony and all this kind of stuff going on there. 
they sound trumpets and attend, you know, uh, their appear uh, and their appear, uh, sorry, and attend to their appearance with all manner of elaborate preparations. The Lord will set the stage for His return by just demonstrating His authority over the universe. That when Jesus Christ comes back, it's not going to be this, you know, all parades and pomp and all this other stuff that we go, wow, they must be important because they're putting on all this stuff. Jesus is going to, you know, demonstrate it by showing his authority over the universe. When he comes back, all of creation is going to be a part of it. I mean, to fully understand everything he said, you know, that would take place, we also, you know, need to look at what was recorded by Matthew and Luke. We talked about you know, Mark chapter 13, verses 24 and 25, and it says the sun, sh- uh, the, sh- the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken. But let's go over to Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, and see what that says. It says, The sun be darkened, the sun shall not give her, sorry, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You say, well, that's really close to what Mark said. Well, let's look at Luke. Luke gives actually a little bit more uh, information on this. Luke says this, and there shall, sorry, Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26, it says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon. And in the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking out after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Let's take a moment you know, to dissect some of these verses. All three of these letters, uh, writers tell us that there will be signs in the heavens, that the sun will not shine. Imagine... I mean, just imagine that, that the implications of the sun are not shining anymore. Men cannot live without the light of sun, right? Temperatures will fall drastically. The earth will be uh, plunged into utter darkness. In that darkness, even the moon will not shine. Why? Because it can't, because it merely reflects the light given off by the sun. The stars, uh, you know, that sit, you know, in the heavens will fall from their places and the heavenly bodies you know, that are so constant in their movements that their position in the sky can be calculated with, a, with, minute, per, uh, sorry, with minute uh, precision thousands of years in advance will fall throughout the universe. Think about that. They have been able to send satellites up into the uh, sky into the universe and all these other places. How? Because they go back because everything is, is so precisionally you know, knit and tightened that they can, they can go back and look at where everything was. Nothing is by accident. Nothing is you know, random. That, you know, despite what evolutionists say that, you know, bang, it happened, and everything just perfectly went into order. It didn't. God said it that way, and, that, and from that way, we can actually go back thousands of years to figure out where something was at, so that way, you know, perhaps you know, thousands of years later, it doesn't get hit by a planet randomly, you know, randomly. And so we need, you know, we need to you know, realize that. And the thing is, is that with that, that precision that is there, those stars, everything is going to fall from that place throughout the universe. The heavens above will be seen as absolute chaos as the stars fall you know, from their orbits and travel uh, through space with no, uh, no design, no direction. Luke tells us that even the earth is affected, that tides are no longer uh, predictable and tidal waves will sweep over the land. You really want to be a part of this? You know, for those that sit there and say that they want to be a part of the tribulation, you want to be a part of all this? I don't understand it. More power to you if you want to, if you make it that far. These verses, you know, describe a scene of utter chaos as the universe literally goes into chaos. This, you know, scene is described in uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse uh, 12 and 14. Let's flip over there. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6. Verses 12 through 14. It says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black, 
as a sackcloth of, of, of hair, and the, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree uh, uh, cast uh, cast her untimely figs, when she is uh, shaken of a mighty wind, and uh, and uh, heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled up to, uh, together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. I mean, think about that. Mountains, islands, everything's going to be moved out of their places as well. Another place you can look, but for time's sake, I'm not going uh, to go there, is Isaiah chapter 13, verses 6 through 16. And the chaos there that is described is even far worse you know, than what was described in Revelation chapter 6. Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter 13, verses 6 through 16. One, uh, one uh, writer wrote this, describing, uh, des- trying to, to uh, fathom and trying to describe everything, even by the fact of the earth's access being you know, off by just a mere fraction of an inch. Because you know, obviously the world, you know, the earth is tilted on axis and then goes around. And, but even if the fact that if it was moved by a mere inch, this is, uh, this is what would happen. At that very moment, an earthquake would, uh, would make the earth shudder. Air and uh, water would continue to move uh, th- uh, through inertia. Uh, uh, hurricanes would sweep the earth and the seas would rush over the continents, carrying gravel and sand and marine animals, casting them on land. Heat uh, would be developed, rocks would melt, volcanoes would erupt, lava would flow from, uh, from fissures in, uh, in the ruptured ground and cover vast areas. Mountain, uh, mountains would spring up from the plains and would travel and climb on, on the shoulders of other mountains. Uh, causing uh, faults and rifts, lakes would be tilted and emptied. Rivers would be uh, cha- uh, would change uh, their beds. Large uh, land areas with all their inhabitants would slip under the sea. Forests would burn, and and the hur- uh, and uh, the hurricane and the wild seas would wrest them from the ground on which they uh, they grew and uh, pile them uh, pile them up as branches and root in giant heaps. Seas would turn into deserts, their waters flowing away. I mean, think about all that stuff happening, and there are people going, yeah, I want to be a part of that. Why? I mean, think about this. Flip back over to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verse 26 says this, men's, heart, uh, men's hearts failing, uh, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Just that little part. You know, I mean, men's hearts failing, for, uh, uh, failing them for fear. I mean, if you saw that stuff, would you not be afraid? Don't be trying to be all manly and stuff. Be like, no, I think it would be awesome. No, you, you would be scared out of your mind. It says, and, uh, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. I mean, this means that the events of those days were so terrifying, so frightening, that people were, will literally die of heart failure when they see these things happening. That people are going to go, and just literally, you know, like minds blown, you know, going out there, what's happening? The fra- uh, you know, the phrase, heart fa- uh, uh, hearts failing, literally means that they will... They will breathe out or they will bust out. In other words, they will expire. Millions of people will see these events in the heavens, which will be clearly visible because the sun, uh, you know, uh, because, of, because of all those events you know, that are happening, it is going to be obviously a terrible day that's going to happen. What causes all this mayhem in the universe? Our text says, the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken. The word power refers to influence or control. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we are told that Jesus upholds all things by the, pow- by the word of his power. The Lord Jesus created uh, this universe and holds it all together through what? The power of his word. He controls the movement of every planet, every star, of every particle of dust in the universe. Nothing moves anywhere without his permission. 
That is why the movements of the, uh, of the planets and the stars can be calculated with such precision. On that day, Jesus will remove his controlling hand from the universe and he will allow it to spin out of control as he sets the stage for his coming back to the earth. So we've looked at so far at the sequence of his coming. We've seen the setting of his coming. Now we're going to see the sign of his coming. The sign of his coming. Verses 26 and 27 of Mark chapter 13. It says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then uh, shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost uh, parts of the earth and for, uh, and, uh, to the uttermost part of heaven. Matthew uh, 24, verse 30 records the, uh, you know, the, the same thing as, it says, And then shall uh, appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The Lord's disciples asked a question back, uh, back, in, uh, back uh, earlier in Mark 13, in verse 4. They said this, it says, Tell us, when sh uh, shall these things be, and when shall be uh, the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled. They asked that question. Jesus had told them that the temple would be destroyed. The temple was destroyed, right? Back, in, you know, uh, back uh, earlier in verse uh, 2, it even talks about it. Jesus says, and, uh, he says, and Jesus answering said unto them, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not uh, be thrown down. That's the reason why I, I talk about the fact that I have said it and stated that where currently the Jewish people are, are praying at the Wailing Wall, they say that's, that's you know, the old temple. It is not the old temple. Why? Because Jesus said that there would be no stone left upon another. If there's a stone left upon another, what does that mean? That that wall there or, you know, is either the old temple and Jesus is lying or the Jewish people are praying at a wall that is not the old temple. There's a lot of people that believe that, you know, that where they are worshiping is an old fort, that where they sit there and, and they make prayers you know, you know, unto God and everything else is not that one, that it's an old fort that they're worshiping at. But they don't want to admit that they missed the, uh, that they missed the Messiah, so they're not going to follow this, obviously. But Jesus Christ told it. Why? Because in 70 AD, that temple was destroyed. And that's why we always talk about, you know, you'll hear Christians that are looking forward, you know, to, to the Lord's return will always say, we're looking forward to the third temple because the second one was destroyed. Why? Because they didn't need it anymore. Christ, you know, uh, uh, tore the veil in two, right? And everything, uh, uh, there was an earthquake, the veil torn in two, and Jesus, you know, had already purchased our salvation with his own blood. So why would they ever, ever, ever have to make another sacrifice? Why? But that's, that's what they want. They say, well, the reason why we haven't continued with animal sacrifices is because we have no temple. And that's why they're going to keep on pushing until they get a temple. And you say, that's never going to happen as long as they're fighting and arguing. It will happen. It will happen. Why? Because the Bible said so. And here's the thing is that as soon as that temple uh, was destroyed, they expected the Lord's return to be very soon. They believed that Jesus was on the verge of setting up his kingdom. After all, he had cleansed the temple in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. He already had cleansed it. He went through there and started, remember, because all the people out there say that Jesus is just love. He never does anything bad, never hurts anybody. I don't know when you take a, you know, a cord and start whipping people because they're selling stuff in your temple. I think Jesus was a little mad. They say, well, Jesus never shows any, you know, he, he never shows any anger or anything else. He just says, just love, 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 love. You know, go against them and you'll find out. You know, all that love that he has. Why? Because as many as he loves, he rebukes and chastens. He's going to discipline you. He's going to try and get you into that place. That's the reason why God will, will send, you know, heathen nations against a godly nation because that godly nation oftentimes, you know, backslides and God's like, you know what? I need to get you back to where you need to be. And the sad thing is, you know, for us humans, is the fact that oftentimes when we have trials, when we have tribulations, that uh, you know, brings us back to going, oh, oh, yeah, God, I needed you. I still need you. But when we have, you know, time of comfort and, you know, and everything else, we sit back and we relax. We're going, everything's good. Why do I need the Lord? Don't do it. Because, you know what, as soon as you get to that point, God's going to say, you know what, 
I'm going to send, I'm going to send something to get, you, to get you back into realizing that you need him. He's going to do it. He also demonstrated the hypocrisy of the religious uh, you know, um, elite, you know, that he had, uh, <clears throat> yeah, he had demonstrated their hypocrisy in the latter part of, uh, of Mark chapter 11. And they didn't understand while the temple was being destroyed in just a few uh, short years, the rest of the Lord's prophecy would not be fulfilled until a thousand years later or thousands of years later. They wanted to, to know the sign of his coming. In verses 5 through 25, Jesus gave them a general list of, sign, of signs that did not predict when he, uh, uh, when he would come back, but they do teach us what the world will be like when he does come. Because oftentimes people say, well, the Bible talks about wars and rumors of war. That's been going on for thousands of years. Yes, Jesus never said that that would stop, and then all of a sudden we would have a war. He just said, you know what, he gave general things that were going to happen, that there would be earthquakes, so there and if you don't realize it, I mean, there's, I should ask my daughter this because she knows it. How many, what was it, how many uh, earthquakes take place in one year? Earthquakes. Earthquakes. It was a lot. She, I was like, you watched it the other day, and I can't remember. All right, well, there's a lot. There's quite a few. But we have those going on. People say, well, there's earthquakes all the time. There's pestilence all the time. There's, you know, famines. There's all these things going on. You know, what's the thing is? The thing is, is that, you know what? He just, he said, you know what? It's just going to get progressively worse. That the events of the tribulation will occur. That the Lord will put out the sun and the moon. That he was, he's telling them all those things are going to happen, plus these things. And a terrifying scene develops in the heavens as the planets and stars and other heavenly bodies rampage at full tilt, uh, destruction through the universe. Then we have the sign of his coming. That's, everybody's like, oh, that's, that's what it's going to be. Mind you, and I want to you know, let you know, all this stuff that I've uh, talked about so far this morning, you will not be a part of. If you are saved, you won't be a part of. Because this, this is stuff that is happening you know, in that seven-year uh, tribulation, and at the end of that tribulation. We're gone before the tribulation. Aren't you glad? And yet you still have those ones going, I want to be a part of it. I don't understand it. I don't. The sign, uh, you know, the sign is the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the clouds above. When we get to that end, Jesus Christ is coming back in the clouds, as it says, with that, you know, I mean, and he's going to come back, and then at that moment, that's when either you have you're going to have two parties. You're going to have those during the tribulation going, thank the, you know, literally, thank you, Jesus, for coming back because I did not want to go through that, but, you know, but I shouldn't have you know, taken it for granted and should have went out in the rapture in the first place because uh, there are people out there going, well, I, have, I still have a second chance. I can just go through the tribulation and I'll make it through it. You don't understand what that tribulation is going to be. Or you have the other side that's completely terrified because they've rejected the Lord not only when times you know, were not quite as bad as the seven-year tribulation, but now they're even worse and still reject the Lord. Why? And then, they, and then they're going to see him coming, and they're, you know what? they're still not going to be happy. Why? Because he's coming in judgment at that point. I'm debating you know, in and of myself to continue. I'm not going to, because here's the thing. I don't want to rush through the, you know, the, the remaining part of, of this message. I believe, you know, you know the thing is, is that what, we, what we've you know, gone through, what we've seen so far as far as in the revealing uh, you know, of Christ, you know, that second coming of Christ, when, they, when he comes back upon this earth you know, with his saints. When I say with his saints, why? Because the rapture is for his saints. He's coming for his saints. But when he comes back, you know, and lays his foot upon, you know, sets his foot upon this earth, that is that he's coming with his saints, and that is in judgment. And then you have that seven-year period in between that, you know, that in the midst of that, you know, seven years, that's when the Antichrist uh, goes in the temple and declares that he's God. That's when you're going to have the mark of the beast. That's when you're going to have all these things happening. That's when you're going to have two-thirds of the Jews killed. You're going to have half the world's population taken away. You're going to have all those things. If that's not enough, you're going to, you know, uh, you, they're going to see the sun and the moon you know, being darkened and everything, all the, you know, everything being taken away in darkness. And then yet, we still have those 
that would say, you know what, I think I can make it through. If you're saved, you're not going through it. I, hate to, I guess I hate to be the bearer of good news to you. But if you're saved, you're not going to, the Lord's going to be, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, poop on your parade and say, you know what, you're coming with me because you don't want to go through what's about to happen. And it's kind of funny that I have to say that, you know, that there are people out there going, no, I just want to be here. I just want to be, you know, no, you don't. You don't want to be here when it happens. You don't want to be here, you know, when that seven years happens. You don't want to be, you know, just because you think you're strong and powerful, that is nothing compared to what the Lord's going to do. That is nothing what the Antichrist is going to do. And the Antichrist is nothing compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we have people out there still, you know, with that in their mind of saying, I read these things and I still want to be a part of it. Like I said, if you're saved, God's going to take you out of it and he's going to say, you know what, come here. Look at how dumb you were going to be. Do you still want to be a part of that? I don't. Thank God I'm saved. Thank God we're saved. Amen. Amen. If you're not uh, this morning, I would just, you know, if you say, you know what, I, I, I don't think I'm saved or I don't believe that I'm saved. Here's the thing. There are times, where, you know, in your life where you're not going to feel saved. You know that? There are times you're going to wake up most days and going, I just don't feel saved today. Because we oftentimes want to have this supernatural experience of always feeling joyous and, and whatever. We're not Joel Osteen, and we're not a false prophet like he is either. Because he, he, he's trying to get in people's minds that, you know what, that somehow if you have a sad thought, or if you don't have enough money, that somehow you're doing it wrong. I don't lay... I don't set up, you know, treasures here on earth. I set up, you know, treasures in heaven. I don't care, uh, you know, about how much money I have down here. I care about, you know, the fact of my rewards that I'm going to get in heaven. I don't sit there like Joel Osteen and going, I got to have a you know, million dollar plane or, or like all these other, you know, false teachers and false prophets. I honestly was kind of hoping this time around, not saying that I wanted Kamala Harris to win, but I was kind of hoping in some way, shape or form that Donald Trump wouldn't win. So that way all the false prophets would be exposed yet again. Because all of them back in 2020, oh, Trump's got this, he's going to win. I was not happy about, you know, who became president. But I was happy with the fact that all the false prophets were shown for who they actually were, that they were false, that they were false teachers going around. Oh, yeah, there's no way he's, he's going to get in there. And in this entire four years, they've been going, oh, he's coming. Oh, he's waiting. He's, oh, you know, just wait for this date. That date would pass. Nothing changed. Oh, well, he's coming. He's got all this. Oh, you know, I was, you know, something happened over there, you know, the kind of whatever. They have all kinds of excuses, these false prophets and teachers. And whatever, and, you know, I sneezed wrong, so I got it wrong. And then, you know, they came, they have all kinds of excuses. And so, like I said, I was hoping that these false prophets would have been shown wrong again, that he didn't win. But he did. And you know, you know who put him in that place? The Lord. Here's another thing, you know, another shocker for you. You know who put, you know, Joe Biden in? The Lord. You know who put Barack Obama in? The Lord. Do you know who put, you know, George H.W. Bush in? The Lord. Do you know, you know why? Because oftentimes a nation gets what they deserve. Makes you kind of like, oh, oh man, what did we do? I tell you this, the Lord would have came a whole lot faster if Kamala would have gotten off us. You say, well, Pastor, how can you make it that political statement? I just know what she believes. She hates, you know, she hates Christians. She hates all that kind of stuff. She's made that known. She's been on televised, you know, televised, you know, talking about how she hates Christians. They're at the wrong rally. Back to my original thing, you know, my original topic is the fact of this. If you're not right, if you're not right with the Lord, you're saved, but you're not right. I would say that you, uh, you know, come forward, come to the altars, get your life, you know, straight with the Lord. Get your life right with the Lord. Because you don't want, you, you don't want to, you know, suffer the, you know, uh, you know, any kind of repercussions. Obviously, the fact is, is that if you're saved, you're already going to heaven. But the thing is, is that you've got to be about your father's business. It's not looking busy. It's the fact of being busy, being about the father's business. How is that? What does that mean? That means doing the Lord's work. That means going out and talking, uh, talking to people about Jesus, trying to get them saved, trying to you know, see if others want to get saved. I'll tell you this, it's getting harder and harder to reach people uh, you know, with the gospel. And you say, you know what? 
Well, then why should I go? Because I want to go after that one that doesn't know. I mean, that's, isn't that what the Lord did? The Lord said that he left the 99 sheep to go after the one. Why would I not want to go out there and have that possibility of, of getting one more saved? Just because it's getting hard? I mean, that's like a farmer saying, you know what, the ground's a little hard today. I don't think I'm going to go out there and do anything. How long is that, you know, that farmer going to last? Not long. Or you know what, I, I don't think I can make it another hour. I know some farmers in the room that, you know, sat there and, and farmed for like 48 hours straight or even longer. You've got to be about the Father's business. Amen? And secondly, is the fact is, is that if you don't know the Lord, you know it. He's like, I'm not saved. This morning, get saved. I talked to you, you know, earlier, you know, or earlier about how to do that. That is that you put your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did upon that cross, that sacrifice, that blood that was shed. The Bible says that, that without the remission of sins, that there, uh, that there uh, sorry, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So you, you trust that sacrifice. You believe that that blood is enough to save you, to cover you, to wash away your sins. That you say, you know what, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and what he did for me. There's nothing about what you could, that's the only thing that you can do. If you, if you want to sit there and say, well, I have to be able to do something, that's the only thing. You can't say, well, I'm going to give up this, I'm going to give up that, I'm going to give this up. Because nothing that you can give up even comes close to what God gave up. And the last time I checked, there are just people out there saying, you know, you know what, I, just, I repent every day, I do it, I, I, I keep myself perfect. No, you don't. Because that thought right there is foolishness. The Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin to him. You can't keep yourself clean. The only one who can is Jesus Christ. And he does that when you get saved. Does that mean that you, need to, that you don't ever need to ask him for forgiveness? Well, let me ask you this. If you go up to your spouse and you never apologize for the things that you've done wrong, how long is that marriage going to last? It's not, if it does last... It's going to be a very, very rocky relationship. So the reason why you ask for forgiveness, the reason why you do those things, why? Is because you want to keep that relationship good with the Lord. You want to keep that connection with Him. You don't want to have any kind of, uh, any, you know, anything else other than that, right? So for the next few moments, like I said, if you're, if you're backslidden, get your life right. Be about the Father's business. If you're not saved, get saved. And if you need you know, help you know, uh, to be led to the Lord as far as like what to do, what to you know, pray or whatever, I'll pray with you. Other, uh, others in this room will pray with you. But for this next few moments, I want us to inspect our hearts, make sure that we're, right, you know, we're in right standing with the Lord or that we're actually saved. Amen?